Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Hello, everyone. It's the addition in her hair. Welcome back. I know you're here. So we're gonna start with one question. Well, it's actually not a question. Look down at your belly. Go ahead. If you see the beginnings of a protruding belly, I'm afraid you might be insulin resistant. But don't worry, don't get scared. It's not just you. In fact, over 40% of the American population is insulin resistant. But don't freak out, this can be totally managed. Us dietitians know insulin resistance can be totally managed or improved, but only if you follow the right diet and lifestyle protocol. Only if. So it's no wonder in today's video we are going to talk about insulin resistance, the signs and symptoms to watch out for, and what to do if you are indeed insulin resistant. All right, let's start. Insulin, the master hormone. From an overall health perspective, it's the sustained elevation of insulin what's problematic, not insulin itself, because you need to produce insulin, yes or yes. So insulin's main job is to lower blood sugars but it also plays major roles in other metabolic processes. And for this reason, insulin is known as the master hormone. All right, I am going to use some graphics, so it's going to be very easy to understand. Insulin is a hormone made by your pancreas, and its main function is to help keep blood sugar levels normal. When your blood sugar levels go up, insulin is released into the bloodstream. Insulin then helps facilitate the transfer of glucose into your body cells and tissues. And as a result, the sugar levels in your blood go down. I always say to think of insulin as the key to enter the cell and deliver that blood glucose from your meal. And ideally, insulin keeps blood sugar levels within a narrow, healthy range of 70 to 120 milligrams per deciliter. Excess insulin shifts metabolism into storage mode, converting dietary sugar and fat into stored body fat. Too much insulin is inflammatory because it raises cholesterol production to unhealthy levels and makes the kidneys retain sodium causing water retention and contributes to high blood pressure by stimulating growth and thickening of arterial smooth muscle. So every time you eat, insulin spikes. It's just that each macronutrient spikes insulin differently. And that's what we care about. We are going to take a look at carbohydrates and insulin and how they affect each other. When we eat a meal high in carbohydrates or sugar, these are broken down into glucose, but in high amounts. Insulin will try to bring your blood sugar levels back to baseline because your body knows that excess glucose is toxic. This can lead to a situation known as insulin resistance where the cells stop responding to insulin. So blood sugar levels remain high while more insulin is being secreted to counteract the high levels of glucose in the blood. So you're in a situation where your blood sugar is high and your insulin is high, but your body can't bring those levels back to baseline and therefore your body is going crazy. But not only high levels of insulin are toxic to the body and create further inflammation, but it also makes you store fat. Why do you think insulin is known as a fat storage hormone? When insulin is high, this means you have a surplus of glucose in your blood. This glucose serves as energy. And of course, if you don't use that energy, it's stored as fat. And why would your body tap into your own stored body fat when it has a surplus of glucose in your blood? That's why an elevated insulin makes it really hard to lose weight. 
So basically, insulin resistance will appear when the body becomes less sensitive to insulin's effect on blood sugar. It's essentially a faulty insulin. And this is so concerning because this leads to increased blood sugar levels and carbohydrate sensitivity, then prediabetes, and eventually diabetes. Now let's discuss the signs and symptoms that might indicate your insulin resistance. So the first symptom is frequent urination at night. The kidneys have to make more urine to transfer the sugar from your blood and excrete it. So you have to get up several times at night, which affects your sleep and compromises your overall health. And of course, this makes the insulin problem worse because you're tired the next day. It messes up your circadian rhythm. You're hungrier during the day. And this creates further systemic inflammation because, remember, during our sleep, our bodies regenerate. So if you don't allow that to happen, it's no wonder any health problem will get worse. Number two, not satisfied after eating. You've had your meal, but you feel you could keep eating and eating because you don't feel full or satiated. Or you are hungry again, let's say 30 minutes later after you've eaten. And this is a big indicator you are insulin resistant. Why? Your body is not regulating blood sugar levels properly as the cells in your body are not able to absorb the glucose and use it for energy. That's why you might have heard before that insulin resistance essentially leaves your cells starving in the sense they can convert that food into energy. And that's why frequent hunger and always needing a snack between meals or at night would go hand in hand as well. Third, the need for a nap after eating, especially after lunch, especially after a high carbohydrate meal. Number four, swollen ankles. Insulin resistance makes the kidneys retain water and sodium, and therefore you are more puffy. Of course, this puffiness can be applied to anywhere in your body, but ankles tend to be the classic. But other common ones are legs, feet, wrists, or face. Of course, drug side effects can also cause water retention, but since we live in a high-carbohydrate society, it's most likely to be the high carbs. Number five, this goes to my women. Irregular and or painful menstrual cycles. High insulin can cause the ovaries to make more male hormones. This imbalance of hormones such as too high estrogen and too low androgen levels or vice versa can cause your period to become irregular and or painful. And in fact, this hormonal imbalance is seen in polycystic ovary syndrome or PCOS. So our number six is PCOS. PCOS and insulin resistance go together like siblings. And let me tell you how many women find that when they address their insulin resistance issues, their PCOS symptoms go away or at least improve dramatically because, of course, other factors could be causing that PCOS. Number seven, lessening of the production of breast milk. Moms, please keep in mind high insulin leads to high androgens which can create a lessening of the production of breast milk. Men, don't worry, I haven't forgotten you. Our number eighth is low testosterone. High insulin inhibits the activity of the HPG axis, which is the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, thus lowering the concentrations of testosterone in men. 9. Our beloved acne, which is one of the symptoms seen in PCOS. To this day, guys, there is so much compelling evidence that shows that high glycemic low diets worsen acne by increasing the levels of IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor. Number 10. Dark skin patches. High levels of insulin in the blood can trigger the appearance of dark, dry patches of skin. And in fact, dark skin patches are very typical in diabetic patients. Number 11. You have a belly fat. So you look down and you cannot see your feet because you carry a lot of weight in your midsection. 
when your insulin resistant excessive fat gets stored around the organs in your abdomen. And this is known as visceral fat. And I don't want to worry you, but as a dietitian, I have to tell you, too much of any body fat is bad for your health. We know that. But compared to the fat that lies just underneath your skin, which is the subcutaneous fat, the visceral kind is more likely to raise your risk for serious medical issues. And by the way, there's something known as skinny fat, where you have fat around the organs, so you don't necessarily see it in the outside, in the legs and arms, but they have a belly fat. So just know that type 2 diabetes can develop in patients of normal weight or even underweight. They look skinny, but they still have a belly fat. Number 12, you feel dizzy often and or need sugar or something to eat to feel energized, like a snack. Number 13, fatty liver. Remember what we said about the correlation between high insulin and visceral fat. Fat molecules accumulate inside liver cells. The presence of those fattened cells can lead to inflammation in the liver and damage surrounding liver tissue, leading to fatty liver. Yep, very concerning. And lastly, our number one indicator we use to diagnose someone as pre-diabetic is elevated blood sugar. A blood sugar level less than 140 milligrams per deciliter is considered normal. A blood sugar level from 140 to 199 is considered prediabetes. This is sometimes referred to as impaired glucose tolerance, aka insulin resistance. A blood sugar level of 200 or higher indicates type 2 diabetes. The first thing that will probably go into your head is, okay, so if high carbohydrates raise insulin the most, then what makes the most sense would be to lower my carbohydrate intake. And that's a smart speculation, but it's not all about the carb amount. It's also about the inflammation. So what can we do about it? Inflammation and insulin resistance go hand in hand. In fact, there was a very good study that I wanted to share with you guys that found that inflammation activates and increases the expression of several proteins that suppress insulin signaling pathways, making the human body less responsive to insulin, which increases the risk for insulin resistance. So let's think about it for a second. That if inflammation stops insulin signals, causing insulin to not open the key to transfer that glucose inside the cell, then that glucose stays in the blood and blood glucose keeps increasing till toxic levels. And this makes sense because even if we lower somebody's insulin by decreasing their carb amount, if we don't lower the inflammation, the insulin resistance is never truly fixed. So this means that even if we attempt to lower somebody's insulin by decreasing their carb amount, which is actually the protocol we have to follow as dietitians, if we don't lower the inflammation, we will never truly fix their insulin resistance problem. So the real question here is how do we lower the inflammation? And here is where a good practitioner should ask themselves. Does the patient follow a whole food, nutrient-dense, organic, not processed diet that is varied and diverse to ensure they get all the daily nutrients they require, both macro and micro? Macro are your protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And I know you might think, okay, you just said that carbs are bad. Carbs are not created equal. There are good carbs and bad carbs. And then our micro are our vitamins and minerals. So are all those nutrients covered? How is the stress life of the patient? What about their mental health? Because there is so much evidence that it has proved that the mind dictates our health. And we all know that. 
we all know what it feels like when our mind is just dark. Whether it's walking, dancing, cardio, weightlifting, yoga, running, whatever you want. But as long as you move, it's good. Pick an activity that you enjoy. It doesn't have to be high intensity interval training. As long as you move, your body is happy. How many drugs is the patient taking? And have we considered the side effects of those medications? As you can see, even if we lower the carbohydrate intake, if we don't fix the inflammation, we will never truly fix that insulin resistance. And this is why a lot of doctors do not succeed with their treatments. They just tell their patient to lower the carbohydrate intake without considering the diet and lifestyle quality. Quality. Not carb amount, quality. They just simply stick to their protocol of monitoring the blood glucose and if those blood sugar levels are low, it's fine. Yes, their blood glucose might appear fine, but the inflammation is still there. So the insulin resistance will be masked or it will come back eventually. And then you have others who don't even talk about lowering their carb amount or the inflammation, of course, and they just expect the patient to get better with glucose lowering drugs. <laughs> you know, those who love to give drugs like candy. So again, it's not all about lowering carbs. We know that one works. The moment we lower someone's carb intake, their insulin levels drop. But if there is inflammation, that problem will never, never, never go away. So the conclusion is, if you want to manage your insulin resistance or high insulin levels, we first need to decrease the carb amount. For those who have a stubborn weight, a protruding belly, or most of the signs that we previously mentioned, I recommend to not exceed the 70 grams of carbohydrates per day. And for those who need a change ASAP, do not exceed the 50 grams of carbohydrates. So 50 grams of carbohydrates or less. And then to lower inflammation, eliminate refined processed GMO foods, hidden chemicals, added sugars and synthetic vitamins. Always read the back of the label. I always say, if you can't read it, it's most likely bad for you. Lower or eliminate medications. Of course, this should be first discussed with your doctor. Try to have a conversation with them and talk about the possibilities of decreasing or even removing those medications altogether. Eat a whole food, organic, nutrient-dense, varied diet. Ensure you are getting all your daily nutrients, both macro and micro. Deal with the stress. And what I mean is both physical and emotional. Take action. Talk to a loved one, a friend, a family member, or seek help from a therapist. Whatever you need to do, but take action. And lastly, you need to prioritize daily physical activity. Even if it's 30 minutes of walking a day, you have no idea how powerful these can be. Don't forget that the smallest steps can become the biggest ones.